Oh, is this like GDP or some shit? I thought it was going to be a, a much more theoretical episode. Oh, it is much more theoretical. Yeah. Okay. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Does this count as theory? Fuck, I hope not. <laughs> Hello, it's a bonus episode. Uh, you've heard us all chatter shit before. My name is Tess. My pronouns are she, they. These two people are with me, Bart and Dean. How's it going? Aside from your awful cold wedges. Hi, I'm Dean. I'm eating cold wedges. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm Bart. I go by he, him as well. And this is usually the level of anhedonia that I bring to episodes. So I'm glad that it's uh, <laughs> it's spreading. Cold chips are good. Okay, but they're cold wedges without anything else. Like hot wedges <laughs> with like sour cream and sweet chili sauce. Sure. Cold wedges with nothing. There's salt on them. Clearly, I have enough of that already. <laughs> <laughs> they were crunchy fried, so they've got, like, the fried taste on top of the potato. Yeah. Potato is itself delicious. I just don't like cold chips at all similar. But this again- entire podcast is about things you don't like, so we'll just add it to the list. <laughs> <laughs> on well, blast today, potato unheated. I think personally I'd go some sort of sauce or something. They're a bit dry, like your cold wedges by themselves, I would say. Nope. Well, you see, I drank the last can of cider in the fridge, so he is, <laughs> tragically, a thirsty boy. Today, we're talking about models for population growth and resource production and consumption. So this is kind of theory, because we're talking, like, top-level abstractions about how much is produced by a population and what, how and what they need. Uh, wow, well, the last time we looked at this, we got to see the logistic map. I'm sure you've got something even more exciting for us this time. <laughs> <laughs> One of the weaknesses in this kind of thinking is like the variation in things like resource use. We'll get back to it a bit, but let's just say the people who are causing the climate crisis by their individual consumption all have names and addresses. So you can send them a nice letter asking them to stop. Any of us in the West, we might have to make some sacrifices if we're not going to survive the apocalypse. Yeah, starting with the fucking SUVs. <laughs> Absolutely. So in fact, we are going to start with a finite resource model. So what I mean by that is literally the amount of resources available to the population is fixed and finite, and it is in fact the logistic growth map. I remember this from the episode logistic growth map. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Starts out with a couple numbers, ends... With a horrible event horizon of pain. <laughs> I feel like if the episode was called Logistic Growth Map, that would be like The Empire Strikes Back being called Luke, I Am Your Father. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what this is, go watch our episode about it. I'm not going to revisit all of it. What I care about for this episode is that the map assumes finite, constant resources, but dynamic population. How can it be finite and constant? Because you have the same amount of resources available all the time. Oh, right. I'm thinking like a video game where it's like this node never runs out but gives you 15 iron per second. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you, it, that is a finite, constant amount of resources. If it went 15, 1, turn, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, and just kept on going up, that would be infinite. Right. Yeah. Oh, I thought... Um, whatever. I was thinking you meant constant in terms of like... I have this bit of iron, it might rust, but the amount of atoms is still, you know, around. Okay, so when we're thinking about, like, resource available here, you can think of it as the amount available at any given point in time. Right, right, right. So, finite, as in, it does not go off to infinity. Constant, it's always the same. You got one field, more or less you're going to get the same amount of potatoes out of it. Yeah, there is some ecological justification for this. On the biggest scale possible, the universe that we can access in the long term is finite. On that sort of scale, sure. On the local level, as Dean has said, you have a given patch of land. If you want to think of it in terms of energy, which is not a bad metric to go, there's only a finite, relatively constant amount of sunlight that hits that land each day. From which you can produce, at the end, only so many cold wedges. Exactly. The idea here is that you have what's called a carrying capacity, which I cannot spell. See, I was correct in thinking in terms of video game terms. In terms of video game terms. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, can we cut that? Can we cut that back so I sound smarter? No. All right. <laughs> Look, if, if I, I don't cut asked, all of my stumbling, so I'm not going to cut all of yours. If I hadn't mentioned anything, you may have done it out of pure reflex. Why do I... <laughs> Masochism, I suppose. Yeah. So this is the population that can be supported by the resources. Again, I must state, a little bit of Malthus here. We'll get to him. 
All right, marvellous. Yep. And this is very explicitly not Malthusian for reasons we will understand shortly. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so the idea here is that if you go above your carrying capacity, somebody's going to die because they don't have enough to eat. If you're on the space station, you're only producing so much oxygen. Yeah. So you're on that, submarine, that... you're only producing so... Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it gets shorter every time it compacts. But what do you think of the submarine? We've lost Bart. Oh, no. Tess, very sadly, we'll have to cut this entire section. Technical difficulties. I'll take the opportunity to play with kitties. Little Kato scratching you on the head. Ah, shit. Hey. Well, my thoughts on the submarine that is that even if it was poor people, it would be funny. <laughs> and it's even more funny that it's Rich like cunts, the yeah. worst people in society. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So as mentioned, finite resources is a reasonable assumption on a very big scale or on a local scale when you can't change your environment. But it's a bad model for either open systems where you can have stuff coming in from outside or any kind of social species that actually interacts with and modifies it in its environment. So I'm thinking everything from ants to humans here. We actively change the resources that are available to us, and the logistic growth map is unable to account for that. So we need to move up to what we call dynamic resource models. Right. Before here there was a forest. Now I grow, I don't know, potatoes. Yes, a monoculture of potatoes, <laughs> and then the famine strikes. <laughs> I'm fairly sure Dean is playing the uh, Lukashenkoist uh, <laughs> I can't look, I've just uh, eaten a bunch of wedges, right? i got potatoes on several <laughs> of my organs, including the brain. <laughs> it's his Samwise Gamgee era. Yeah. <laughs> I have neither boiled them, mashed them, nor stuck them in a stew, but nonetheless, potatoes. <laughs> They're delicious. I, I've, I've eaten a raw potato like an apple and enjoyed I, it. That's weird, man. i got to be with you. <laughs> Honestly, that does not surprise me. <laughs> They're good. So in the dynamic resource models, the amount of resources available can change over time. There are finite resource models that encode dynamics, but we're not going to focus on those because that's a whole other thing that you see more in ecology, and I'm more interested in the batshit insane ideas that economists have to come up with. Oh, we, okay, this is going to be fun. I right, look, got to admit, I was a little worried. We're talking about theory. We don't have a biblically accurate angel, angel drawing, so I'm getting worried. But now we get to make fun of economists. Dude, every fucking episode goes like this. Uh, no, some of them include the horrible angel drawings. Okay, but that was right at the end of the episode. <laughs> we were thinking, not talk about economists before that. Anyway, carry on. I, look, I'm excited now. Don't try and talk me out of my position of excitement. I, I'm not. Okay. okay, Dean, don't try and get me sidetracked with like my weird like obsession with various theological schools and when they arose. <laughs> like, <laughs> look, we're going to talk specifically about infinite resource models. When you enable cheat mode. Yeah, so you can basically read this as for the practical purposes of us as humans, what is our capacity to increase the amount of resources that are available to us, right? And on the very big scale, there is no practical point at which we will run out of space, right? Or run out of planets or stars or whatever for foreseeable future. Locally, we're having some problems with this in the short term because we keep fucking up our environment, but that's slightly separate to what I'm going to talk about here. Right, if you had cheap and reliable space travel, there's enough stuff just in the solar system. Yeah, that sort of thing is talking about, like, getting into sci-fi ideas about what does it mean to become post-scarcity? How do you use up all of the available materials and energy that's incident on the Right, and eventually if you let the yeah. population explode, it, you'd get to whatever where yeah. that wouldn't be scarcity. But for the purposes of, if you suddenly gave people that bounty for their purposes, it's fucking infinite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk about predictions that encode limitless resources, but the rate at which those resources become available varies. All right, so all of these models go to infinity, but the rate of change differs. And first on is actually Malthusian dynamics. Before we get into the Malthusian dynamics, I'm not like on that shit, but at the same time, like it seems like the kind of less poverty in your society, the less people want to have children. And so it kind of like balances out in the end to some extent, you know, like. So that's about population dynamics. Yeah. Well, we will talk about this in just a second. Don't worry. I guess it's the best way. Sure. To, yeah, yeah. So Malthusian as a, an adjective is usually applied to asshole ideologies for a very, very good reason. And we will get to that. 
But the fundamental idea is that you have what's called linear growth of resources. I will work out or tell you what that is in a second. When your economic model becomes a pejorative, you've done something fucked up. <laughs> it's only a pejorative if you're not a fascist. That's true. In which case, you have fucked up. Like if, yes. If only the fascists say you're, uh, you're a valid school of thought, you're fucked up. Liberals as well, yes. You say that, but I think that there's a lot of, like, Malthus's ideas sort of soak through, like, most political ideologies, honestly. Like. I'm going to be very, very specific about what I mean by Malthusian yeah. once I've established this, right? Because it, it is quite specific. So you have linear growth of resources and what's called exponential growth of population. These are different types of rates of change. Your linear increases by the same amount for each identical time period. Just occurred to me that it was somewhat auspicious to get on a potato track on the episode <laughs> we're talking about Malthus and uh, population control. I'm going to not carry that association into when we start talking about contemporary uh, famine events. Mm. So if you want a mathematical model, the amount of resources that I'm going to call X at time T is equal to your starting resources, so the resources at time zero, plus some constant rate of change times time, right? right? This is a straight line over time. So it looks like yeah, yeah. this. As you have more people, they can plant more uh, crop. This, as written, is not linked to your population size. This is one of the... We'll get to it. This okay. is one of the problems with it, right? But the basic idea here is that, let's say, time down the bottom and resources on that axis... It's going to confuse people. But Over time, you set up more uh, robots that farm for you. But basically, if we look at, like, we come up here, we go across, we come up here, we go across, and so on. Yeah. All of these intervals are beta high, right? So, at... That would be why they're so short. Yes. So, if these are equal... In, like intervals of time on that time axis, you get equal increases in resources in your resource axis. What does beta mean in this context? Beta is the rate of increase yeah. per unit of time. Beautiful. It's linear. Yeah, straight line. So when I say per unit of time, whatever unit you are counting time in, if it increases by one, you get an extra beta. Nice. Yes. Not true in the real world, but it would be nice to think about. <laughs> <laughs> and here we get to the Malthusian bit, which is that population increases exponentially. Right, so he's saying the population will outstrip the capacity of that yes. population to produce resources. So what exponential means, broadly defined, is that the rate of increase increases, but in a mathematical form it has a very precise sort of meaning. So the resources at time t are equal to your starting resources multiplied by some positive number, let's call it one plus beta here, two time. It's exponential because this is the exponent. One plus beta has to be bigger than one because if you multiply a number smaller than one by itself, it will shrink. Right. If we are measuring this in units of years, right? So let's say this is x year five is equal to the resources at year zero times one plus beta times one plus beta times and you do that five times is there a reason the greek alphabet is involved or could it just be like is it just like a stand-in yeah yeah so this is representing some positive number that is added to one so you have an something that's growing here yeah right? so the use of beta in this context is done by convention i chose it Okay. I chose it specifically. <laughs> Why not Why? Because I'm using resources on that axis. If we come back here, right, I fucked with what the axes are. So the horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is X, which right. is my resources. Gotcha. So I didn't want to use Y because then I thought that would be even more confusing. Right. As opposed to just making the X Y so it's set on the Y axis. Yeah. And then you could have made beta X. No, because time is on the X axis. Oh, right. Yeah. It's a good question to ask because the notation can be confusing. Yeah. I have chosen beta to just represent the parameter that describes the growth rate. Yeah. Because I, it is distinct from English characters. Yeah. So exponential growth looks like this, roughly. 
There are multiple different ways that you can have change over time that increases. This is a specific form of it. You've done a lovely curve there. Look at that. I'm all right with curves. Straight lines, yeah, but you know. I've never been very good at straight. <laughs> so if we look at roughly equal time increments there, and we come across here, the rate of increase is getting bigger as you go, right? So you've got X here and time on this axis. So you think this is here one, two, three, four, five. It's getting, th these gaps are getting bigger each year. Yeah. Because it's growing exponentially. As Dean has already mentioned, population under this model outstrips resources. There is a very specific way that that happens, which is that if you have two things that are growing over time, and one is, let's say, linear, let's say it's growing like that, and one is exponential, it does not matter how fast or how slow your exponential growth is. So in this case, we'll have beta smaller. In this case, we'll have beta larger. Exponential growth will always eventually outpace linear. So this is your X and this is your time. The point of Malthusian models of population of resources is that at some point in time, the population will always exceed its carrying capacity because we can bring the idea of carrying capacity over here. So the big idea here is that at some point, population will exceed carrying capacity. The older I get, the more sympathetic I get for all those religious people trying to like keep Darwin down because he does like <laughs> quote Malthus quite a bit in uh, the evolution of yeah, the theory of natural selection. Yeah, look, there are some issues with applying Darwin to people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like a lot of the opposition was out of the social Darwinism that was forming at the time. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> but, I mean, this is why we had our episode on eugenics, right? Yeah, absolutely. So can I just ask, so in the Malthus model, right? Yep. We've got a linearly increasing yield of your resources. Yeah. So an exponentially is... increasing population. What is his reasoning that an infinitely increasing population couldn't also generate exponentially increasing resources. How does he... Well, this is one of the problems. Assuming he his, has some... His logic was basically that because you do not have infinite land, you cannot produce infinite food. Right. Which is not unfair, but I think it fails to properly account for the actual reality of how labor works, how um, material productivity can change. Right, and it's just a dick move to say, well, we'll reach that, that at some point. So um, I get to keep having a big garden rather than a, <laughs> a farm uh, and a whole bunch of poor people can starve to death. Yes, Malthus, of course, was very enthusiastic about starving and murdering poor people because they were having too many babies. Right, yeah. Right? Honestly, and, I, I mean, respect it more from him than like most of the novelists of like the Victorian English period where... They just didn't talk about all of the fucking genocides that were that their empire was committing at the time and were kind of like committed to yes, it. Yes, like, whereas he was like, we are doing it and it is good. I kind of prefer that to like, I don't know, fucking 40 million dead in India and no one talking about it at all. Yeah. You know, absolutely. There is, there is, you, you under no circumstances do you have to hand it to fascists and eugenicists, but- at least when they're committed, they don't fucking disassemble all the time. <laughs> they say the quiet part loud, and that at least... You is... know who you need to... Uh, you know who you're dealing with. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, for Malthus, of course, he was very worried about the poor brown people who were having too many kids. That idea is still hanging around. Every time you see somebody from, like, the UN Human Development or the Gates Foundation talking about population size. Yeah, Bill Gates' things. obsession with birth control. Woo. I mean, uh... so if, if these people are serious, that they're interested in things like birth control and access to reproductive health for the interests of women's rights and, and the rights of people who can be gestational parents and things. Right, but I don't believe that for a fucking No, second. no, if they were serious, they would offer support for things like IVF. Yeah. But they don't because it's actually about lowering birth rates. Those people don't didn't like it when industrialization in the Soviet Union meant that uh, women could 
make more choices about like their reproductive rights and stuff yeah. like, it's very cynical and it's very fucked up like you can look at any number of charity quote unquote and global development programs that are built on a similar foundation there was also a book called the population bomb that came out in the 50s i think but has been shall we say popular among a certain crowd since that was basically talking about all of these awful things like forced sterilization programs and starving the third world that America should champion in order to get the population under control. Yeah. If you look at a plot of the human population over history and you look at like the 20th century in comparison to that, there is a genuine explosion in the population yeah. because fewer people are dying of horrible diseases more than anything else. Yeah. Of course, you know, the First and Second World War killing off tens of millions of people is like another thing entirely. But you have seen a massive explosion in the population. What you have also seen is that between having more people to do labor and having technology which allows your labor to be more productive, there is a relationship directly between the population and the available resources. This model of Malthus, which uncouples the two, so these are uncoupled in the sense that there is no direct relationship between the resources and the population. Right. It just is not encoded. Yeah. We can see that this is not realistic on top of Malthus being a colossal asshole, right? Right. Looks well, like... Basic Starcraft logic. You've got so many probes that can mine so many minerals. Yeah. It's kind of out of fashion now, which is a very thankful thing, but I don't think we move past this without saying that large aspects of the left were on this shit when I was a teenager, oh, yeah. certainly. Like, yeah, yeah. Out of the environmental movement and anarcho primitive kind of stuff that was kicking around at the time. Like, we're not free from sin on this kind of thinking. Oh, yeah. Don't never forget that the anarcho primitivists have sort of embraced Ted Kaczynski as their icon and topical. The guy just died. Uh, they, The people who started doing that were not ignorant of his leanings, no. shall we say. The fact that he was also kind of a fascist. You know. Right. And even though eco-fascist is a term that gets used by right-wing people to describe literally any direct climate action. Well, yeah, there are actual there are literal eco-fascists and they are not on our side. Yeah, yeah. The Kaczynski thing is like interesting because like people who would not have agreed about with him about most things kind of agreed with him you know um it was not just like the am amprim people who were like fully on that like social darwinist shit which is kind of where it all kind of leads honest to god like radical organizations fucking loved ted kaczynski back in the day this is a deeply kind of i guess ideological and political thing to say is that what malthus is trying to grapple with the fact that we do not have infinite capacity to provide for people's consumption is not wrong. Yeah. It's just that the people whose consumption is driving that using up of resources are not the poor brown people. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And as I pointed out, Malthus wrote this text. He clearly started with the idea that we need less poor people. Yes. And it has come around to this model. I I don't think that we can say that he was just just asking questions in no. good faith. <laughs> that Enlightenment tradition, as much as it provides everything that is kind of like useful to us at this point. Yeah. yeah. I disagree with that. All that shit comes from that. It, it yes. can't really be separated. Yeah. Well, one of the things that Darwinian, I'm, I'm making air quotes here, that like natural selection and competition models fail to recognize, particularly in social species and cooperative species like humans, is how much the ability to change the environment radically changes structures of competition and the way that cooperation radically changes structures of resource availability. The social Darwinists are completely unable to recognize this because they see everything as a baseline competition between different types of people. <laughs> wink, wink, doing nudge, nudge. Yeah, quite, yeah, 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 yeah. Perhaps we could shade them by, do them by different colors that we yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, here are the purple ones, for example. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't care if you're purple, blue, or... <laughs> well, like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, social Darwinism at this point, like, because of the Nazi association is right, uh, no one, like, would openly identify with it, except that like is not true. <laughs> people do, and they are fasc. fucking fascists. Yeah. But I do think the underlying thinking persists much, much more like liberal. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, the liberals will forcibly sterilize you. They won't just murder you for being disabled. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. liberals will do all the same shit, but then write an op-ed about how upset it makes. <laughs> yes. I'll add one last thing. When you scratch 
at any of these social Darwinists or any of these people who make an argument that there's some underlying logistic reality. So what do you mean by logistic? grounds for, like... Uh, so some underlying reality with a carrying capacity. Or, yeah, like yeah, Malthus, okay, or yeah. somebody who says, like, the, a demographic reality, or, yeah. like... Any time you look at these people and they try and fall back on Darwinism or some kind of... Whenever they try to launder their bullshit intellectually, it always falls apart the moment where you point out that their game theory doesn't account for the fact that humans can change the rules of the game. Yeah, and we will cover this extensively, I think, when we do episodes about like mutual aid and ideology structured around mutual aid. But if you are a, shall we say, a, a genuine Darwinist about the human species, if you fundamentally believe that humanity has to change in order to survive long term, what you look for is cooperation capacity. What you look for is the ability of people to share resources and get along. Because as soon as you have a species which is able to join its resources, join its labour, join its effort together to provide a better future for everyone, they will succeed over a species that is trying to kill itself off as a result of direct competition between individuals. Yes, social Darwinists... Uh, everyone's a social Dar Darwinist until you talk about, like, debt forgiveness for... <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is that if Evo psych people were serious, that'd be communists. Yeah, no, if you go you go deep enough, it turns out, oh, fuck, there's a material reality. Yeah, I'm going to wrangle us back. I am going to go one step more complex than the Malthusian model. No! I know. And I'm going to introduce a relationship between resource availability and the number of people. Can I, while you're just drawing, make one observation, which is just that you could probably guess the reason we're getting so easily distracted is that politics is about the allocation of resources. resources. Yes. So this is the this is the most political topic. You can there's a reason <laughs> we can riff on any connection to any ideology or or current yeah. event because this is and bone also, deep to what it means to be political. And also these models for the relationship between population and resource availability are so deeply entangled in ideology yeah, that yeah. you cannot talk about them without talking politically. Right. And, and that's one of the reasons that they are so ideological is because ideology is this deeply political yeah. concept. I mean, even me about to introduce a relationship between resource availability and people, there is an ideology behind that. Yeah. So I am going to say that on average, and that is important, we'll get back to it later, people can produce... The ideology is coming from inside the house. <laughs> inside the head, even. Slightly more than they need in, shall we say, a basic level of society. So what I mean by basic social structure here is I am talking about anything where you have some group of people who can cooperate to gather resources from their environment, right? You're yeah, talking right. tribal structures to early agricultural stuff. The fundamental idea is that, on the whole, each individual person's labour produces a bit of a surplus. There are like phrases from African tribesmen, for example, where it's like the best place to store food is in your friend's belly. The scarcity that is experienced by any society pre-refrigeration is not an issue of production because as Tess is, is writing, most people in most contexts can produce slightly more than they, they need. The issue is the variance season to season, year to year. Yeah. Even your, your basic subsistence farming peasant is not merely subsistence. The problem is, is that he has a bad year. You can't store anything for long enough to mean that he doesn't fucking die. For sure. And also he has a fucking landlord. Right, right. But, <laughs> but, but, consider, but, right? but No, no, but this is important because if I write this down as one plus beta times the number of people... Beta here being the rate of increase? Beta here is the surplus. Right. One here is what a person needs. Your landlord is taking beta. Right, and we can see that not just, I mean, lit your literal lord, the literal lord of your land would yes. take your surplus, and then he'd have so much, a huge part of his problem was selling it, building huge cathedral, these massive monuments, because the actual surplus from an agricultural collective is absolutely fucking massive. And the problem is... It depends on... Okay, so this is where we, we need to step back from this kind of max high level sort of abstraction and talk about the material conditions actually on the right, ground. But that's, right, but that's what I'm because, getting. Yeah, yeah. Because 
the technology matters here, right? When you look at actual people living in tribes in, let's say, places in Papua New Guinea where they are still living in those sorts of tribal societies, they go hungry a lot of the time. They do have seasonal periods of hunger and whatever else. They are very barely above subsistence. But because they are a small number of people and they have not transformed their environment to be maximally productive which is not necessarily a bad thing, their surplus is small. Right. As I was saying before you so rudely interrupted, <laughs> in a feudal context, this is how you get these massive architectural works, despite the fact that the majority of people are living in this subsistence model, because yeah. the difference in class between your... It's not accurate to call you know feudal lords you know, capital class, etc., but there is a class distinction here. Hmm. The upper class is insured against these variations in output. Yes. And, and are able to produce and lock away these massive surpluses that they appropriate into stores and into alternate forms of wealth and into these massive collective projects, whereas you've still got these people living from season to season where their individual, individual variability, and yep. if they can only just kill off the fucking <laughs> landlords, then they, they could potentially have that bit of insurance. But keep in mind that... You know, the church through charitable arms did assist with this, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we can't just apply Marx with a complete uh, reductionist. <laughs> this is kind of where that from each according to their ability to each according to their need comes up, right? For sure. As kind of a, a Marxist ideal for how this works. Because as soon as you have this sort of a setting, and I'm going to rewrite this slightly to be one times number of people. But the point I was just getting at is that in all of these examples, we can see demonstrated what you were talking about which yes. is that we do have this this surplus even among peoples we would consider yes technologically limited compared to ourselves yep and i'd also be critical on marx on this because like he was like i don't know in various writings he seemed to like the kind of imperialism that the west was imposing marx was counting on this surplus upon the b on the beta being pretty fucking chunky and he saw capitalism as a way to, yeah, to get so, that so, up there. But that means he was quite like cool with the British invasion of of China or India or whatever. Yeah, yeah, which is which is fucked up. Yeah. So what we see here, right, is that this Man should have been more patient. Is our surplus resources. Yeah. yeah. At the point where that surplus is big enough that the next person along doesn't have to work for everybody to survive, you start getting division of labor. Right, and you start getting specialization towards things that are not explicitly productive. Politics starts to occur. I would say it happened before then, but yeah, certainly the, when it comes to the allocation of resources, it stops being number of people and starts being number of people, brackets, productive. Yeah. And uh, as somebody with a disability, I am going to immediately stamp down the idea that people who are not maximally productive or below average in their productivity are somehow worth less, because it just doesn't fucking work like that. But you have this fundamental idea that you can have people who are not directly productive as soon as you get to a certain level of surplus resources, right? And we're only using a very given... This is very, very abstract. This is not directly connected to anybody's particular actual conditions, right? Right, because there's means of there's means of production which aren't necessarily cranking out a grain. Yeah. And particularly the further you get from working in the field, the more people are able to do which is not explicitly working in a field or similar, like, physically laborious things. This is going to be a bit of me getting digging another stab into Evo Psych, or, I mean, I guess, Evo Anthropology to some extent. It's slightly better research. But there is a theory called the grandmother hypothesis, which is basically asking, why do postmenopausal women survive yeah. Yeah, 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 it's pretty fucking grim, yeah. right? But the, the hypothesis that always comes around is basically that they provide childcare to the rest of the community. And to some extent, that might be true. What I think is forgotten is that older people who are no longer able to work productively because they, their bodies are no longer up for it are stores of knowledge. And when you have an oral history tradition, those people are your library. And this is something that no, well, it's been a few years since I looked at it, admittedly, but no sort of description of the grandmother hypothesis or anything like that has ever dealt with that notion. Yeah, they also don't necessarily engage with the notion that um, people don't like it when their grandmother dies. Yeah, funny that. It's just kind of like a human factor that it's it's traumatic and awful to lose somebody who's been there your entire life. So yeah. 
maybe you just don't want that for reasons other than... Yes, it's almost like they're... people have a intrinsic value in a society that is not linked to their ability to produce things. Hang on. Hang on. Are you telling me humans aren't spreadsheets? <laughs> Be careful, an economist might get upset. <laughs> it's Hello. cat time. Whoa. Cat time. Cat Woo. time number one. <laughs> Woo. Oh, yeah, we have a second cat. Eventually, there will be cat content for the second cat <laughs> as well. Oh. Building upon uh, everything you've just said, it seems to be all based in this like individualist worldview, which is not necessarily yeah, subscribed yeah, yeah, to by. So the individualism of basically everything that's come out post Enlightenment is fucked. Yeah, I personally think that individualism as a, I guess, an ideological framework is about the most destructive thing that we've ever produced because it feeds into everything else that's bad. Right, and. We're dealing with people here and deeply human questions. And I'm not saying Tess is, is the producer of these very callous summations, but when you've got one plus B times number of people, the number of people, it's, it's just so reductive. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You're, you are quantifying people here without quantifying things like loving your grandma. Or yeah. I remember as a kid reading all the theories about why I was just hugging a cat, right? Like, why did we domesticate animals? It could be like they keep away pests. So and so. And at some point, I'm just like, maybe it's just cool to hug a dog. Yeah. The, maybe it's just fun to have a little guy. I think a genuinely underappreciated part of human experience and our co evolution with other species with whom we share the world is that there is a serious advantage to the fact that it is nice to hug a dog. Yeah, yeah. And you don't necessarily you see that a, in all the Evo psych or. No, it's because they are unable to conceptualize human experience as anything other than have babies. Yeah. If you manage to kill off the person you're competing with to have babies. Well, honestly... Right, I'm going to wrangle us back again. Ah, Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. quick, really quick summary is that on this podcast, we always are pointing out like the way that statistics contain like these, these hidden emissions or something. But here it's so glaring. Yeah, absolutely. That the human experience is absolutely absent from a question of, as we've talked about, it's fundamental politics. You can't... Yeah. yeah. When you are representing something at this top level of abstraction, which this fundamentally is a yeah, top yeah. level of abstraction model, that is only useful as far as it allows you to talk about how people see those models. Yeah. You can't realistically apply them to actual practice day to day. Right. And that's what make Malthus a monster is he took this and said, and we should let millions All the of brown people, people die because yeah, of this. Millions yeah, of yeah. people fucking starve to death. Yeah. Okay. What we get to here is that this is a model that is exponential growth of resources because you have exponential growth of people. But it does not properly encode the actual dynamics of resource production. So as long as you have an exponential growth in people, it, this model does predict that your resources will exponentially grow slightly faster than your people. But that runs into the fact that you don't have an infinite amount of land. Yeah. So you have to do something else. Yeah. And what you do is you make people more productive. Now, we're going to introduce dynamics of productivity. Ah, oh, the spinning jenny. Yeah. Or the steam loom, or steam plow. Right. And, of course, once you've made it so that one person can do the work of ten, the other nine people just get to relax. That's right. Okay, I'm like the novel idiot, and you know what is so fucking interesting in Pinchon's work is the use of the loom, because the loom is like the first industrial product. It, like, exists initially as, like, a punch card kind of system that is, like, oppressing everyone. And then, like, within a hundred years, it becomes, like, prophecy and kind of religious experience in a weird kind of way. I'm not entirely sure I agree with... What, what do you mean by the first industrial thing? Because, I mean, I look at things like mills for grain. I, I don't mean the first industrial thing. I just mean the first... It's often seen as a symbol as the start of the industrial revolution yeah, yeah. and the social changes. The symbol it, rather sure. than the actual first thing. Like I it's kind of like the first like stages of capitalism from feudalism in a in a weird way. Yeah, right. Our dynamics of productivity are we are going to make our surplus variable. So we're gonna say instead of just beta times the number of people, we're gonna have beta plus increased productivity. I distinctly remember as a young person encountering ideology when I read about the Luddites because my um, hmm. IT teacher accused one of his staff of having a Ladidian <laughs> point of something. I said, what does yeah. that mean? So I went and looked it up and then I read Ludd, you know, this person who opposed the use of 
these industrial technologies because he saw these things. Then I looked up what happened to the lad and I went, this guy's right. <laughs> yep. And then I went back and, it, and it's like, oh, this is a pejorative. Hang on a second. There's some fucking ideology going on here. <laughs> I, didn't even, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I remember just thinking like, hang on a second. There's a, this makes me feel weird. Mm, yes. It's weird about that story that there probably was never a Ned Ludd, but it just like exists in the world and that's the name we call the movement by. Ned Ludd as a symbol, essential in the way that Ned Ludd, the actual person, is not. Absolutely. Symbol? Signifier? Never heard of yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> So the idea here, under capitalism in particular, is that your increased productivity increases exponentially over time. So under capitalism, you have kind of increases in productivity as a result of expanding population, and you have increases in productivity as a result of individual people doing more stuff. What capitalism aims to do is capture all of that for the capitalists. Yeah. The idea of this surplus labor here... You're telling me the history, all of history hitherto has been <laughs> class relations? No. So you can very, very directly go from this, well, frankly, fucked reductionist model to how capitalists think about dynamics of productivity. Because what they think is that, for one thing, as a result of capitalism, productivity is increasing. It's capitalism that does that, according to them, not anything else. Right. And that because it's capitalism that does that, they deserve to capture all the additional surplus. Right. You couldn't stop doing the capitalism, but keep the yeah exactly the productive increases. Yeah. See, I think that's true of economics professors, but I don't necessarily think it's true of the people who are actually in the capitalist position. I think they kind of like. Have you listened to a fucking tech CEO? <laughs> yeah, but those those people are all fucking goofuses. I don't believe that there's some there's some shadowy deal making room, but there are clearly people who are clued in to the fucking relation. Oh yeah, absolutely. All you have to do is read the Financial Times to find them. Right, exactly. Right? And they're very clear eyed about talking like... to capitalists. Yeah, yeah. And they they sound a lot like Marxists when they do it. Yes. The, the difference is that they're like, this is good actually. I'm going to reformulate this slightly because I'm going to introduce the idea that actually what you need to survive can change as well. So are you um, here working towards a model which we might consider more productive? No, I want to use this to talk about other things. Okay. Yeah. So if I put alpha here is the amount a person needs to live. And this can change with time. And this can change its location. My life consumes more by way of resources than somebody who is, I don't know, a forced worker on some plantation somewhere in a poor country, right? I use more resources than that person. And I need them. I will die without them. <laughs> but more importantly, Alpha is the kind of minimum that a worker will demand. You can kind of think of Alpha as amount a person needs to live, brackets, the minimum they will accept as their living conditions. Right. And the hidden ideology, again, talking about Malthus, is that he would never consider his alpha decreasing. No, absolutely As not. opposed to just brown people dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm also going to change this slightly, because we're going to encode everything about the surplus in beta now. The fact that it's delicious? That's why capital wants it. The surplus is so tasty. <laughs> So this is our fundamental resource model here. B now is representative of... So beta is surplus to neat. Both of these are now dynamic, right? Right, okay. Beta increases as things get more technologically developed. Some person sitting on a, a, a John Deere tractor can plough more fields than somebody on a plough pulled by an ox or something like that. Right, right? But the person on the John Deere tractor also needs TV, which increases their alpha. Yes. And so... There is, a, there is a relationship between... Yeah, yeah. And fundamentally, in a very kind of reductionist fashion, labor relations are about how much alpha is in comparison to beta. Right, exactly. It, oh, wow. Politics, the allocation of resources. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who yeah. are we? This is why it's it's so fun. Look, I got to admit, I have since evolved past this, but I did get into leftism because I came out of being an insufferable forum debate guy. <laughs> Look, and I always love to win. And it turns out, uh, you can always be right if you become a Marxist. It turns out that when you uh, reduce it right down to this level, you end up talking Marxistly. Yeah, liberals hate this one trick. Oh, yes. <laughs> they fucking ever. Mm, mm. Expectations is kind of like an important factor. It's more psychological than it is like material. But at the same time, like, I don't think the Russian Revolution could have occurred if like you had a class of people 
peasants and workers who had been kind of like relieved of their like social bonds from the earlier era of the sort of 1860s. Alienation is a tool of the class war, yes. But also like then they had to go fight a fucking stupid ass war. Yeah. And yeah, there was more acute fucking poverty and shit like that as capitalism slowly creeped into Russia. I always get annoyed when, when leftists say, you know, Marx expected socialism to pop up in the capitalist countries. It's like, well, he might have fucking expected that, but... <laughs> he was wrong. He was wrong. And I think he, he missed the point that, yeah, he, he didn't underestimate the power of treats. <laughs> or sorry, rather, he did underestimate the power of treats. Yeah. No, nah, well, I, I think there's like a different explanation to that too, is that the institutions of the working class were quite easily bought off by people who, like, as we see with the Labour Party today, but, like, it was true in... Germany, yeah. Fucking 1918 Germany as well. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. You have, like, a layer of people who are in the institutions of the working class but are, like, subverting the revolution, you know? Like, it's... um Treats is reductive. It was able to happen in Russia, Russia and China just by the fact of, like, those parties were made illegal. They were able to, like, have, like, a more strong front. I'm going to wrangle us back again, right? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listener, if you're thinking, Dean didn't... Dean was incorrect on this particular topic. Uh, it's Tessa's problem. I didn't get to say the correct thing because she cut me off. That's right. So whatever you think is correct, I said that. So capitalism says that beta increases exponentially... And if it's not, then alpha should get smaller. Oh, austerity. Mm-hmm. And whom should it get smaller for, Tess? <laughs> well, <it's, laughs> when you see percentage growth, specifically a positive percentage growth, this is a model of exponential growth, right? The percentage might not be constant, but it's always positive. So if I have my, let's say we start with a million dollars company. Yes, please. <laughs> First year, it grows by 3%, so this looks like 1.03. Second year, it grows by... Oh, I don't need brackets, because I'm doing this as numbers. Second year, it grows by 1%, 1.01. 1. Third year, it grows by 5%, 1.05, and so on. This is exponential growth, because you're multiplying it by a bigger number every time. Oh, so we're supposing that the tendency of the rate of profit is to increase. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, so what we're saying is that capitalism... Um, presupposes that that happens. Yep. Okay, and it'll work so long as that happens. Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. We're uh-huh, sorted. Uh-huh. If you've read uh, Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism by uh, Lenin, it's like super enlightening because it like posits that all these individual capitalist countries are like working towards monopolies in every industry and then from that point they have the power of the state to like invade other countries yeah um that is an oversimplification but it's a very good book and i highly recommend everyone read it but it kind of rules in the modern era with the fucking streaming services that we always like <laughs> yes. television yeah, yeah. on what a more pressing example is look at the patents on um, COVID vaccines. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was massive international pressure and fucking... Bill Gates? Yeah, these yeah, fucking... Yeah, Bill Gates fucking shut that shit down. It's, it's awful. And, those int- and that is violence. That is yep. a violence that is being done. It's not using a gun, but yeah. People How much died it- as a result. It's not even subtext. So much of the text around, like, the new belligerence against China is that... Intellectual property. Stuff. Intellectual property disputes. Like, yeah. they don't respect their intellectual property. It's like... I don't respect your fucking intellectual property. <laughs> critical support for the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> I don't know about that one. But yeah, I said it, critical. It, critical support. Hypercritical, perhaps. But, <laughs> but yes, in- intellectual property is a tool of class war and imperialism. Absolutely. What we get from this, this idea of this kind of exponential growth of profit under capitalism, is that a company is no longer a success merely by breaking even. Right? Yeah. A company that is merely profitable isn't enough. It must increase its profitability, and the rate of increase of that profitability must continue to go up. There are, shall we say, exceptions now that we have come to a cool zone with many heightened contradictions under capitalism, but this was the model. Your profitable company had to see proportional growth every year. You can see exactly the same thing in CPI. The expected level of inflation for, like, the Reserve Bank of Australia, for example, is between 2 and 3%. 
which means that the price of everything is expected to increase exponentially over time. This is an exponential growth model under capitalism. And that's a healthy way to run a, a society. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If you want to hear a great breakdown from an unexpected angle of like the, the profit motive working inimically against its own stated aim, uh, well, There's Your Problem did a whole episode on the US rail network mm. and the ways in which maximizing for profit and return on American rails, it turned out for a long time to be to do less trains which you'd think would be the opposite of ah, how they would manage that. So I want to make a very important statistical point here, because that episode was a statistical disaster more than it was necessarily an engineering one, and they nixed something that I had wanted to talk about. Anyway, <laughs> but, Post in the but, Patreon comments, I'm sure. They <laughs> but the fundamental issue there is that how the rail companies measured profitability was bad because they they used a unit of measurement which didn't even represent profitability on the whole it was a metric that was like profitability per unit of something and the per unit of something meant that running less trains was better even though running fewer trains meant that your total pool of profit was smaller <laughs> right but what i'm what i'm getting to at to you is that for the purposes of capital, that was fine. If you invested yes in the railways, no. you were making fucking bank because the money you got in... No, okay, so this is a disconnect between the actual productive work that is being done by the railways and the shares in the railways. Wait, right, but I'm saying that disconnect... Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it exists. But we are talking here about share price, which is not the same as profit. Yes. And it is very, very important to make that decision because we're going to talk about tech companies in a second. So what we are seeing there is that the share price kept going up because in all of the reports to shareholders and things, the rail companies are saying, look, this metric, this profit per unit, whatever metric is getting bigger as we're doing these things. And the shareholders all went, fantastic, your shares are worth more. <laughs> right? But the actual return on those shares was dropping because the total pool of profit was shrinking as this metric went up because they were doing less. It's just that each individual's thing that they were doing was marginally better by this metric. Right, but what I'm what I'm getting at, but isn't it amazing how she has a don't interrupt button, but we don't. Yeah, because I run the fucking podcast. Interesting. But <laughs> now, for but for me, she holds a gun to my head. How is she getting you to be quiet? Uh, she got honestly, like a bomb like collar I'm, or something like that. I'm like forty five percent invested in, po in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if just wants to go on a rant. I'm I'm down. But um, no. What I was going to say point, though. My no, but my but uh, but I've wrested control of the bomb collar. <laughs> <laughs> the point I was trying to make is just that when you end up with these capitalist financial instruments, very quickly, the product of a particular endeavor of a particular firm, like a, a railway or whatever, rapidly become, becomes unhinged from its aims. Would you like to see the next section of my fucking notes? Well, maybe. <laughs> So I want to talk more about the disconnection between actual productivity and capitalist expansion. Mm -hmm. Because what we are seeing with tech companies now, like think about Uber or whatever, that has only been profitable for like one quarter since its in invention. These are no longer co companies where profit and the actual services provided that generate that profit matter. That has stopped. So much so that not, so many of them don't even pretend to offer a service. Yeah, I mean, what you, this is perhaps less true now that the free money tap has been turned off because their interest rates are non-zero. But what you see is that for most of these companies, how they generate that shareholder value, right? How they increase the value of their shares is that they promise at some point in the future there will be a monopoly. This promise has so far failed to materialize for literally any of them because it turns out that actually you can't do that. But they still try and the shareholders give them exponential growth in share value, which is what they are now measuring as a metric of actual worth for our company by simply saying, well, if I own these shares, some other sucker might buy them off me before the dip or if this company happens to become a monopoly, then they will actually be valuable. Shares no longer represent 
a theoretical, I guess, anticipated return on future earnings, right? That's what share prices are theoretically, according to the fucking economists, meant to represent. Okay, now that is 100% not going to be true very quickly. No, it, I don't think it's been true for a very, very long time. I don't think it's been true. <laughs> but this is what they will tell you in economics at university. Yeah. They will tell you that a share represent the, sh- the value of a share represents the anticipated return on investment from profit as share prices go up theoretically that represents greater confidence in the amount of return you expect a greater return in the future from profit if your company is never profitable that lie goes out the fucking window once again we run into the problem that humans can change the rules of the game yes but what we are seeing here is, I think particularly in the last generation, let's say, since the dot-com boom, really, the notion of profitability has been disconnected from value, and the notion of a return on capital has been disconnected from anything that is actually productive. Everything now is purely inflationary. And, and gambling. It's straight up People just understand that it is speculative gambling. Yeah, but more than that, scam. Right? More than that, this idea well actually let's go back to this idea right that you have resources or let's think of it as labor capacity right yeah. broadly defined the ability to do stuff and make things this is no longer where money goes because the rate of profit on it fell no hang on that, that doesn't make sense we said <laughs> it'd go up <laughs> no 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 the rate of return on capital has continued to go up but the actual return on labor and resources has yeah, not. Yeah, it has a tendency to decline. To me, this is just that digital and digital scams are just the new, it's just the newest, most fragile frontier yeah, absolutely. that we've managed to open so what to we pillage. Can, what we can see is a transition over time away from directly productive things. So, like, you start with your... Let's go Marxist, right? You start with your feudal society and you have an industrial revolution. This is still a productive advance. Yeah. As you go on, your primary production moves offshore, but it's still primary production. But this is a reduction in alpha. First, we upped beta through the industrial revolution. Then we suppress alpha by taking all our shit offshore to where it's cheaper. What do you do ne- do next? Well, you start to develop what's called a service economy in the Western world, yeah, yeah. which is less directly productive. And then as things like marketing expand, quite literally less directly productive and less actually doing things. And then as the return... Yeah. No, I, I agree. It's fine. <laughs> you have a bullshit job. We know this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It lets me do the podcast, so it's okay. Um, right? Uh, as, uh, I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not sorry. Done. As, I just, as the, no. She has the collar. You're going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you go from the service economy and perhaps the rate of fall doesn't continue to rise exponentially, let's say, in that sort of environment, where do you go? You start moving to an asset economy instead. And you can see this in the kind of new feudalism that we have in real estate now. Uh, Well, the growing new feudalism, I'd say. It's not quite there yet, but certainly as more people become renters and as rental income becomes more concentrated, that will accelerate. You see it in the way that you have record stock values over COVID and they're still fucking going up. We have never seen as valuable a stock market at a futures market as we do now. And you see it in all the bullshit around Web3. Because every bit of the blockchain as it got used for like cryptocurrencies and things, anything related to virtual assets, these are purely inflationary. I think that things like the the board apes or whatever, they function a bit like fine art when it comes to using them to manipulate your own asset value. But as soon as they are sold for the first time, just like fine art, they become a purely inflationary object. This is doubly true for anything related to a cryptocurrency. And quadruply true if it's the balloon ape. <laughs> is it the balloon ape getting big and round? I just want to push back on that slightly. The outsourcing is kind of the most important part of that process. We have just outsourced the like important parts of the economy to places that pay less wages. Yes, and we are continuing to outsource, right? These things are not discrete, right? They overlap. Now we outsource our Web3 shit. So you outsource the creation of your database that you use for your AI model or whatever the fuck, right? But can I can I maybe rephrase, Tess, what you're saying in perhaps a little more 
consumable way, which is that capitalism needs a frontier. The yes. lie that these that the internal market is capable of producing ever increasing value has always been a set dressing on the pillage of something other places the rape of the third world the environment all these other things and as the rate of profit on that comes to decline there's no more money to be pulled out of the dirt or the soil in easily accessible places we invented a digital dirt from which money could be pulled and that's why it's so fucking inflationary because it's money it's, completely it's not untended. productive it's right. not doing anything at least the one, one thing you could say for maybe we can cheer for some like russian war criminals <laughs> doing a coup over there because maybe that will open up a new frontier well right exactly and it is the reason that the capital is so interested in breaking the so disaster <laughs> capitalism is a thing for a reason right. because as soon as you have a disaster you have a small frontier that they can glom onto right this I'm is pointing also the, gun at the head of both of you so i can finish my joke which is that the problem with capitalism is that eventually you run out of other people's money <laughs> <laughs> literally yeah yeah you can see this drive for a new frontier in even people like elon musk and this stupid notion that we're going to go colonize space yeah because that is the final frontier for us as we currently see it is theoretically actually productive so it does kind of avoid the bullshit you see in like web 3 and inflationary stuff but we can't fucking do it what you need on the ground in terms of infrastructure support to make any capacity for space whatever just yeah. doesn't exist and will not exist as long as we see it as a playground for the very rich at the very heart of this and this is where we get kind of revolutionary with it is a genuine surplus of resources. We could feed everyone on the planet, right? We could have a comfortable level of living for everyone on the planet. And if we look at our population, it's no longer increasing exponentially the way it has. Yeah. So I think that, you know, Malthus was wrong because population dynamics don't work like that. Capitalists are wrong because resource dynamics don't work like that. Also, Malthus was just horrendously racist. But... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, wrong for that and other reasons. Of course, okay. right? But once capitalism has produced the surplus, it is possible to redistribute it. Yeah. And it is becoming increasingly imperative that that happen. Because the people at the top of that consumption ladder, let's say, or that consumption scale, are destroying us in a very, very real and literal way. The first step on becoming a leftist is realising that Ludd was right. Yes. The second step on becoming a leftist is realising that Ludd was wrong. He was right to go and bash something in with a hammer. <laughs> but he was wrong machine. that it should be the spinning jenny. Yes. That is an episode. Listener, you are already a Patreon, I hope, if you're listening to this. If you're not a Patreon and somebody is inflicting this upon you, A, I'm so sorry, but B, give us money. It'll be great, I promise. And I will see you next time, bud. I'll see you then.